My name is Donald Ritchie. Uh, I live in the Scottish borders, uh, although I was born in London. Uh, it's a delight for me to be able to show you how I paint a, a landscape uh, picture. But I should say that um, my background is in science, and I spent my, most of my working life as a, uh, as a geneticist. So I'm a scientist turned artist. I'm going to show you how I paint a landscape painting in oils. Principally, I am a landscape painter, uh, and I also am principally a painter in oils. But in fact, I do life drawing, I do uh, industrial paintings, I do abstract art, and I also work in gouache and watercolour if necessary, but principally landscapes in oils. I admire the work of many artists, both uh, classical and modern, uh, but I especially uh, am impressed by, and I suppose influenced by, uh, Graham Sutherland, uh, by Keith Vaughan, Eric Revillius, Edward Borden, Paul Nash and his brother John Nash, Frank Auerbach, Paul Cezanne, and Giorgio de Chirico. Uh, if I was to be asked what is the painting that has impressed me more than anything else, it would have to be Picasso's Guernica. Uh, this is now to be found in the Museo Reina Sofia in Madrid. And you probably will know, but to Guernica was a town in Spain during the Spanish Civil War. And in, a, in 1937, it was bombed by the Nazis. And there's an interesting story about this, which is that Picasso, uh, who spent the wartime, Second World War time in Paris, was approached by uh, a German officer, uh, and they were discussing Guernica, and uh, the officer said to Picasso, uh, did you do this? And Picasso said, no, it was you. Meaning, of course, that the painting was made after the bombing which was done by the Germans. Uh, many artists will tell you uh, that art is fun. Uh, I don't think it's fun for me. In fact, it's hard work. Uh, there is a constant uncertainty, and there's always the possibility of failure as well as success. So I don't think it's a great deal of fun, but it's certainly uh, exciting. Uh, I don't think painters like, uh, like Rothko, like Frank Auerbach, or like, or like Van Gogh also think it was fun. Uh, and as we know, both Mark Rothko and Van Gogh took their own lives, although I'm not sure if that was about art itself. But talking about art and fun and not fun, I would distinguish between what I would call creative art, which is about telling a story, uh, and I would distinguish it from making decorative art, which I would think it's more concerned with making attractive pictures. Uh, well, that's my introduction, and now I'm going to start working. And first of all, I want to say a few words about materials. Uh, there are a number of things that we need. The first of all is a surface on which to paint. This can be one of many surfaces, a canvas mounted on a frame, uh, a canvas board, which is canvas mounted on a cardboard board, MDF, plywood, or hardboard, for example. With all of these, they need to be gessoed. Gesso is a, a, a liquid of chalk, a resin, and white paint. And this is painted on the surface to give it not just a white background, but also to make it impermeable to the paint, so that the paint doesn't uh, stain through and, and work its way through onto the surface. <clears throat> Thinking about paints themselves, oil paints themselves, my preference is for paints made either by Windsor and Newton, or in particular by Michael Harding, which I think are excellent paints. Uh, what I use are mostly earth colours, which I suppose is not surprising, since I'm painting landscapes, but they are a more delicate uh, colour and they reflect the true landscape colours. And one of the main reasons for this, of course, is that uh, earth colours are actually made from earth or from rock or from soil. Uh, and painting uh, oil paints such as raw sienna or burnt sienna are made from soil in Siena in Italy. Raw sienna is just ground sienna soil. Burnt sienna is where it's heated, which makes it darker. 
and we have raw umber and, and burnt umber as well. So these are earth colours. Um, they're made from earth materials. The colours that I tend to use, although not exclusively, I have some very bright and jolly colours in my paint box, but uh, Naples yellow is one. It's a rather a, a, a gentle yellow, uh, and I use that in preference to cadmium, cadmium yellow, which is a very bright and strong yellow. Uh, yellow ochre, raw sienna, um, yellow ochre, Raw sienna, the colours on the on the labels. Um, burnt sienna, a reddish colour, and Venetian red, which I would use instead of cadmium red, which is a very strong red. Uh, this is burnt umber, uh, a dark brown, and then I would use French ultramarine, which is a warmish blue, and Prussian blue, which is a colder blue. And for green. I would be inclined to use terre verte, which is a, an earth green, as, what, as its name implies, and it's much more earthy and much more like the sort of work that I do than would be viridian green, which is a brilliant fluorescent almost green. Uh, then I would use um, Payne's grey instead of black. I've no objection to using black and will on occasion, uh, some painters will say they would never use black, and I would never say I never use anything. Um, but Payne's Grey is rather a, a more gentle uh, black than, than is um, lamp black. And last but one, I use a very fine colour. It's a, a delicate, beautiful, neutral colour, which is called either unbleached titanium oxide in its Michael Harding form. That's the colour at the... Uh, around the neck of the tube, or Gamblin uh, makes a form which is called Titanium Buff. And I find this is a delightful colour to mix in with, with other colours. Uh, and last but not least is white, Titanium White. Um, recently, I've been using Windsor & Newton Griffin Alkyd Titanium White, and I'm using that because it mixes easily with oil colours and dries quickly. Whites, on the whole, tend to be rather slow to dry. Um, so that's the, the colours themselves. Medium uh, for diluting paints. Uh, I actually use most of my paints straight from the tube, but if I do need to dilute them a little, I would use liquid, which is more of a glaze than a, a diluent, but uh, that would be the medium that I would tend to use, liquid. <coughs> I would also bring with me, and always have handy, two, tins, two, two jars of terp substitute, which I would use for cleaning brushes while I'm on the, on the go. And uh, in terms of brushes, I use a range of brushes, some hog hair, some artificial, uh, and of different sizes, of course. Uh, and what you'll see is that I have a preference for flat brushes with, with sharp square ends. Uh, I sometimes use round br brushes, but these are my preferred brushes. Occasionally, if I'm doing some very fine detail, I will even use a watercolour brush uh, and use paint which is diluted with, uh, with terp substitute. In addition to that, in order to get started, well, we will need a palette knife, partly for mixing paint on the palette, but also for painting with, and I'll show you some ex an example of that later. A marl stick. Uh, this is one that I made myself from a piece of bamboo with some cotton wool on the end and a piece of cloth tied over it. I will show it being used in a moment, but I find this incredibly useful uh, as, as a way of steadying my hand if I'm doing detail. So that's the marl stick. I've mentioned already two pots of turp substitute and, of course, rags for wiping your brushes, your hands, or whatever on. And also some charcoal, uh, which I will demonstrate the use of in a moment, and a fixative, which I have to admit is um, a lady's hairspray. So those are my materials, and we can start from that. Uh, and work our way through doing the painting. Before actually painting, I should say a few words 
about the sorts of things that I do paint. Um, it starts with me out walking on a train, driving through the countryside, and I suddenly see a scene which catches my eye, uh, and I find it deeply impresses me, and I'm really quite moved by that. Uh, and I see this immediately as a scene and as a subject. It has the right balance of light, of shape, and of colours. It often has hills in it. It often has the mark of the human hand with furrows, ploughed lines, marks across the hills. And often I, I enjoy the, 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 pleasant, the, the presence of, of walls. Interestingly, having seen that scene and being impressed by it and wanting to paint it, on another day, a different time of the year, different light, different colours, it will have no impression on me whatsoever. So it's that momentarily, uh, mo momentary impression that really makes the difference between a painting that impresses uh, and makes me want to paint it and one that I just pass on the way with. <coughs> When I am about to start a painting, I make rapid pencil drawings. And here is one that I want to talk about today. This is a drawing of a, a view towards Eyemouth from the road from uh, Ayton. And I shall be painting some of that in a moment. So that would be my initial drawing. It's a quick drawing in pencil using a sort of A4 sketchbook. Um, it, in fact, is part of the creative process, and I'll show you why in a moment, uh, because what I tend to do is to accentuate features, accentuate this hill, for example, and, and the shapes of these lines, uh, and also I will leave out items which I don't particularly want. But I will take photographs to go along with the drawing, and I take the photographs not as a subject to paint from, but really as a means to remind me of the detail uh, when I come to the painting. So here, are, here is a painting of the scene that I've just showed you. And you can see from this that this is a much gentler hill, and the whole thing is much gentler from what I've done. So part of the creative process is converting what you see into what you want to paint. Another issue is with the photographs is what you leave in and leave out. And this is another picture of, of this scene. And you can see there are vehicles running along here. And the reason for that is that the A1 road uh, is passing between where I was drawing from and where I was wanting to get my view of. Uh, and clearly, I didn't want to have motor cars and lorries uh, moving along the road. So that's an example of where uh, I would have eliminated something from the view in front of me. <coughs> so we have the drawing. <coughs> and what I have done in this particular case is redrawn it, uh, just about the same size, maybe modified it slightly in the, in the second drawing. But what you can see is that I have uh, made grids on this, uh, and I've divided the paper into halves and into quarters, vertically and horizontally. And I've also drawn diagonals in pencil in various places. And the reason for doing that is so that I can make an exact copy from this smaller version onto the larger board or canvas on which I'm going to paint. And this particular system of using the diagonals is one which uh, Graham Sutherland used, and it's particularly useful because you don't have to make many measurements other than a half and a quarter. Uh, and so there are no mathematics needed to, to make different ratios. So that's a very useful system for uh, transferring your drawing onto uh, a board. Taking the drawing that I've squared up, um, I've now taken my board, which is a uh, 
two feet by one foot six board. And you can see I've put on it the exact same lines that are on the drawing. So all I need to do now is to transfer the lines of the drawing from here onto here. And you can see I've started this. And I'm using uh, a piece of charcoal. So, for example, um, comes around here. There's these beautiful lines here, which really caught my attention on this particular occasion. And there's a hedge here. with shrubs on it, a man-made line across the field, another one here, and we have some further trees and shrubbery down at the bottom here. And there's a little at the top. So that would that's the process by which I transfer from the uh, squared up drawing onto the board itself. So now we're about to start painting. First of all, palettes. Um, I used to make my own palettes out of plywood, and this is one that I used to use. And you can see that the colours are set out in a particular order. And I tend to keep to that order simply because you can easily remember where the colours are. But in fact, more recently, uh, I've started using disposable paper palettes, and I find find them really quite attractive, very useful to use. <clears throat> so I'm going to put some paints on the palette now. So here we are, ready to go with our palette. What I've done in order to keep things moving is to take another board, which has been drawn, squared up and drawn with charcoal and fixed as the one that you've just seen. And I've also put some paint on it, just to start the, the process, because I really won't have time to paint everything uh, on this occasion. But looking at it, we have some sky, we have this lovely set of lines in the road, the hedge and the, and the bushes here, uh, and some of the fields here. <clears throat> what I'm going to do is to paint in some of the fields. Sometimes I will mix the paint on the palette. Sometimes I will just work at it by mixing on the board itself, really putting it on quite roughly at the moment simply because what we're trying to do here is to cover the board and look to see whether the shapes, the colours, are in balance. So what I don't want to have is a uniform colour across the whole area. What I want to get is variety, which will add excitement. Again, I'm just really roughly filling in areas and this is how I would normally get a painting started. It looks crude and it looks rough, and at the moment it will be, but I normally don't finish a painting at one go, so this will all dry and then can be used for the later coats, which will give it a much more finished and delicate look. This lower front area is really a, is a field which should have a bit of green in it, and I may well add a little bit, but I don't want it to be too green. 
green is actually, a, to many artists, a, a bit of a problem colour. There's, there's too much of it in the summer, to be quite honest. And these later times or earlier times in the year, as we have at the moment with the beautiful autumn colours, give you a much more varied and exciting view of the landscape. So there. So crudely, this is the way the painting is going to develop. You'll have seen that I tend to paint fairly thinly, um, and you can actually see the lines through uh, here. These will, these will disappear in, in due course, and in fact, one of the things I'll do is to have another, put another coat on the sky. Getting the blue worked up now. This is mostly um, ultramarine blue. Although sometimes I will sometimes add a little yellow into it, give it a little variety. And also you will realize that as the sky comes down near her, the horizon, the blue becomes paler. It's a physical effect. So we have the darker colors up at the top. And they become paler as we move down. I will add a little bit of the Prussian blue which has a sort of greenish tinge. Sometimes you can blend these uh, even with one's finger and you can uh, see the clouds becoming very, very much softer at the edges. So that's the sky. Uh, and I think that I won't do a great deal more to this, but what I will do is add some of the lines here to give that kind of structure. And here I would be more inclined uh, to use my mile stick and work gently down here. And again, varying the colour by adding bits of other earth colours just to give that variety. And the green, again, I'm giving some variety to it and even adding some of the other earth colours in. I'll just add a little more to the top here, because really this is the focal point at the, at the top of the hill, which I've already said I have, have, have uh, exaggerated. And I think it gives it a nice shape that works its way down. I think that'll do. And the very last thing I'll do is I reminded you that if there was a, a lot of tiny, any tiny detail, uh, and there is detail up in the trees here, then I would use my terps, make a very thin color, washed out color, and carefully with my mile stick, add the trees in here. And of course, we could also add in some of the bushes down here if necessary. And there are also bushes up here. There. I think that's enough for that painting now. And you can see the way that it's moving. And uh, what I will show you now is one that I did some weeks ago, or some months actually, from which this illustration was taken. So here is the painting as I intended it. Uh, you can see the, 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 the buff fields, the lines across the field, the detailed trees, 
little lovely bits of detail here and these two beautiful uh, green lines with the other man-made lines there. So that's the finished work. Uh, and what I've done for you this afternoon is really a bit of a pale representation, but it's as much as you can do in the time available. So that's enough for that painting. I thought what I would do now is show you two or three more paintings which illustrate uh, different elements of what I've been talking about. This is a painting which is not really a landscape. It's a painting of Ruthven Barracks up near Aviemore. This is the drawing I made in my sketchbook. Quite a simple drawing. Um, I didn't actually put, cr put cross-hatching in on this one. This is the photograph that I took and worked from, but you could see that the painting is actually taken almost entirely, or in fact, in completely entirely, from the drawing that I made. Uh, these are fairly large areas of colour, but you can see I've added variations in, uh, and I've simplified this, this design, and actually made it much pinker. So my creative element, such as, the, as it is, uh, was to add some colour uh, and, and to really move this across the curve at the top of the hill. So that's one painting. Another, which I did quite recently, is of uh, a hillside uh, driving out from the road Kelso into Coldstream. Uh, and this was taken in early September. Uh, and this was a brilliant, luminous yellow colour that the fields take at this time of the year. Uh, fairly simple, but you can see I've added various various variations of colour here. But what I really wanted to show you this for is that the sky has been uh, palette knifed in. So that was painted over and then paint added with a palette knife. And you could see how it gives that kind of broken, bitty sort of structure around that you often see with, uh, with, uh, with clouds. So that's the second picture. And my final picture is this two feet by two feet. Uh, I call it ploughed field red soil, and it shows the red soil, which is so characteristic of Berwickshire. Uh, and the reason I'm showing you this is that it has a mixture of trees at the back, which are largely abstracted. It has this beautiful fluorescent field here, and then this mass of uh, ploughed furrows, which were terribly hard to paint. Uh, there are about three or four colours in each of them. And what I did in this case was to very, very carefully draw out each of these furrows, by pencil in fact, so I knew exactly where they were, because the, the, the arrangement of these furrows uh, is, is crucial to the structure. And if this had deviated at all, and I don't think it has, it would have spoiled, spoiled, spoiled the, the design. So that's the last picture that I want to show you, and uh, thank you very much. Well, I've shown you how I go about making a painting, and I've shown you three or four of my finished paintings. But I should say that not all get finished. Some fail partway through. Uh, some just don't meet the requirements that you set out for them. And the answer there is destroy it. Francis Bacon used to cut up his pictures. I haven't really got round to doing that yet. But certainly, if a painting doesn't work, cover it over with gesso and use it as a fresh service for a new painting. Certainly don't keep paintings that don't satisfy you. It doesn't do you any good at all. And thank you very much for listening to me.